In 1950, as nuclear weapons transformed global warfare, American physicist Edward Teller walked into a classified meeting with a proposal that shocked even hardened military officials. His vision, a single bomb with the explosive force of 10 billion tons of TNT, a weapon so devastating it would make its own deployment unnecessary. Project Sundial represented the ultimate contradiction of Cold War strategy, creating the perfect weapon meant to ensure it would never be used. Through newly uncovered documents and expert testimony, we'll explore this paradox of scientific advancement, examining how close we came to building the ultimate doomsday device, and why even its creators ultimately stepped back from the abyss. the nuclear arms race creating the problem. In 1946, just a year after World War II had drawn to its devastating close, the United States stood alone with a modest arsenal of nine nuclear bombs. This moment marked the beginning of a new chapter in human existence, one where the complete annihilation of civilization had become technically possible. The American proposal known as the Baruch Plan offered a glimpse of an alternate path, suggesting the elimination of these terrible weapons and the sharing of nuclear technology for peaceful purposes. When this plan was rejected, the wheels of history turned toward a much darker road. The psychological transformation that followed was profound. Traditional warfare, a practice as old as civilization itself, was suddenly rendered obsolete. Military strategists who had spent their careers studying battlefield tactics and conventional weapon systems found themselves confronting an entirely new paradigm. As the initial shock faded, a new tactical mindset emerged. A military historian from that era observed, it's hard for us today to understand the level of terror this instilled in people. Like a runaway train gaining speed with each mile, the nuclear arms race created a sense of helplessness that penetrated the highest levels of military and political leadership. By 1949, the Soviet Union successfully tested its first atomic bomb, ending America's brief nuclear monopoly and accelerating the arms race dramatically. The period from 1950 to 1953 created a perfect storm of factors driving weapons development to new extremes. The Korean War heightened tensions between the superpowers, transforming theoretical Cold War competition into proxy battlefield conflicts. Meanwhile, both nations were racing to develop the next generation of nuclear weapons. The hydrogen bomb, which promised destructive potential orders of magnitude greater than the atomic bombs dropped on Japan. Pentagon war planners began developing elaborate scenarios for nuclear exchanges. Military documents from this period reveal an almost clinical detachment in discussing the potential deaths of millions. In one declassified Pentagon assessment from 1952, analysts calculated the acceptable loss thresholds for major American cities, discussing population casualties as statistical abstractions rather than human lives. The doctrine that would eventually be called mutually assured destruction began taking shape during these years, though it hadn't yet received its aptly apocalyptic acronym, MAD. The logic was both simple and terrifying. If both superpowers possessed enough nuclear weapons to destroy each other, regardless of who struck first, then neither would dare to attack. Peace would be maintained through the constant, credible threat of total annihilation. Scientists at laboratories across America worked feverishly to develop more powerful weapons. Edward Teller, a Hungarian-born physicist who had worked on the Manhattan project became particularly focused on developing the hydrogen bomb. His advocacy was so passionate that he frequently clashed with colleagues who harbored moral reservations about creating increasingly destructive weapons. Teller would later inspire the character Dr. Strangelove in Stanley Kubrick's dark satire about nuclear war. As weapons grew more powerful, the military's appetite for destruction increased. Declassified Strategic Air Command documents from 1952 reveal planning scenarios for deploying dozens of nuclear bombs against the Soviet Union in a first strike, calculating potential Soviet casualties in the tens of millions. The same documents contained requests for research into weapons with even greater destructive capabilities. Teller's work on the hydrogen bomb represented a quantum leap in destructive power. While the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki had yields measured in kilotons, hydrogen bombs would be measured in megatons. These developments reflected a mindset that had taken root in certain segments of the defense establishment, a belief that security required possessing weapons so terrifying they would remove Remove any possibility of rational conflict. Project Sundial unveiled the ultimate agitation. 
While the hydrogen bomb represented a quantum leap in destructive capability, it merely scratched the surface of what nuclear physicists like Edward Teller envisioned. In classified military laboratories, a project emerged so apocalyptic that its very conception fundamentally altered our understanding of what destruction means. This was Project Sundial, a device designed to fundamentally alter the planet itself. Teller's single-minded dedication to pushing nuclear physics beyond known boundaries led to a classified meeting at Los Alamos in the early 1950s. There, surrounded by military military brass and fellow scientists, Teller unveiled concepts that shocked even those accustomed to contemplating mass destruction. According to declassified accounts, Teller sketched preliminary calculations for what he called the ultimate deterrent, a stationary nuclear device with explosive power measured in gigatons rather than megatons. Project Sundial represented a radical departure from traditional nuclear warfare thinking. While conventional nuclear weapons relied on sophisticated delivery systems, bombers, missiles, and submarines, Sundial took a different approach. This behemoth weighed approximately 2,000 tons, comparable to a 250-meter-long cargo train. It was designed as a backyard bomb, a stationary colossus meant to remain in place as the ultimate insurance policy, looming like a dormant volcano capable of consuming civilization at a moment's notice. The theoretical yield of Sundial would have dwarfed anything in human experience a minimum of 10 billion tons of TNT equivalent, 10 gigatons. To put this in perspective, the largest nuclear device ever actually detonated, the Soviet Tsar Bomba, yielded 50 megatons, making Sundial potentially 200 times more powerful than the most destructive weapon ever tested. The physics behind Sundial represented a significant departure from traditional nuclear weapons design. Though specific technical details remain classified, theoretical models suggested that the weapon would have created a chain reaction far beyond what conventional fission or fusion devices could achieve. The immense energy required to initiate and sustain such a reaction explains the weapon's enormous size and weight. The projected effects of a sundial detonation crossed from tactical warfare into planetary alteration. Scientists calculated that the explosion would generate a fireball approximately 50 kilometers in diameter. This apocalyptic sphere of destruction would radiate heat at the speed of light, instantly incinerating everything within a 400 kilometer radius. The physical blast would trigger seismic activity comparable to a magnitude 9 earthquake, while simultaneously propelling portions of the atmosphere into space. Environmental modeling suggested that the atmospheric disturbances would contribute to a global nuclear winter effect, potentially causing mass extinction events. Weather patterns worldwide would be disrupted for decades, agricultural production would collapse, and radiation effects would extend far beyond the immediate blast zone. The planet itself would bear permanent scars from such a detonation. What truly distinguishes Project Sundial was the strategic philosophy behind it. This weapon represented the ultimate expression of deterrence theory, transforming warfare into a binary proposition, peace or extinction. It wasn't meant to be deployed, it simply needed to exist as the ultimate guarantee against attack. Military theorists recognized that Sundial represented something fundamentally different, a weapon so powerful it transcended normal categories of strategic planning. It wasn't a tool of war but rather the complete negation of warfare itself. In the minds of its architects, the weapon would ensure peace precisely because using it would mean the end of civilization. This perverse logic, that greater destructive capabilities somehow increase security, represented Cold War strategic thinking taken to its extreme conclusion. The Ethical Abyss When scientists confront their creations, the perverse logic of mutually assured destruction might have seemed rational in government briefing rooms, but for the minds who understood the physics behind Project Sundial, theory collided violently with conscience. Behind the classified doors of Los Alamos and other research facilities, many scientists found themselves trapped in a moral battlefield as devastating as any physical one. These were men and women who had already witnessed their earlier work obliterate two Japanese cities. Now, they faced the prospect of creating something capable of ending civilization itself. Dr. Robert Oppenheimer's famous quote after the Trinity test, I am become death, destroyer of worlds, took on new meaning in the shadow of Project Sundial. While Oppenheimer himself had been sidelined from weapons development by the early 1950s due to security concerns, his philosophical struggle became emblematic of what many scientists experienced. In his previously unreleased personal letters from 1953, physicist Leo Szilard captured this sentiment. We have crossed from creating weapons to creating extinction events. The distinction matters, even if our leaders cannot see it. The ethical crisis manifested physically for many researchers. Medical records from Los 
Los Alamos during this period reveal a marked increase in requests for sleeping medication. One physician noted in his 1954 records that the burden of knowledge appears to be affecting the health of our technical staff. Dr. Hans Bethe, who reluctantly returned to weapons work after initially refusing to participate in hydrogen bomb development, later described in a 1975 interview how he suffered recurring nightmares throughout the early 1950s. I watched helplessly as fire consumed the earth. The scientific community fractured along moral lines. Those continuing work on theoretical superweapons often justified their actions through patriotic duty and deterrence. A senior physicist wrote in a 1953 memo, declassified in 1997, our work ensures these weapons remain theoretical through the paradox of making them possible. This aligned with the cathedral builder's mentality, scientists creating peace architecture through the threat of annihilation. Standing against this view were scientists like Harold Urey, Nobel laureate, and Manhattan Project veteran. A classified intelligence report from 1954 described Urey as a potential security risk due to his emotional opposition to current weapons research directions. The report documented how Urey organized discussion groups where ethical concerns were debated, activities military officials found troubling. Religious convictions shaped how some processed their moral qualms. Catholic physicist Joseph Mayer founded a prayer group at Los Alamos. His personal journal entry from 1954 discovered after his death in 1983, revealed, I wonder if God distinguishes between building a weapon that kills millions and one that kills everyone. I fear the distinction matters to him. By 1955, moral crisis transformed into resistance. Seven senior scientists requested transfers from Project Sundial. Internal security investigations revealed what one memo described as a coalition of technical experts actively working to delay progress on the Sundial initiative from within. These scientists employed very various tactics to prevent the project from advancing beyond theoretical stages. Dr. Victor Weisskopf, a Manhattan Project veteran, later admitted in his 1991 memoir that he deliberately introduced mathematical errors into his calculations. I convinced myself that slowing the project through subtle sabotage was the only moral choice available to me, he wrote. I could not stop the work entirely, but I could ensure we remained years away from implementation. The Rejection of Doomsday, Finding a Solution Beyond the moral objections of scientists, Project Sundial faced an unexpected enemy, the Pentagon itself. What would make military planners reject a weapon of unprecedented power during the height of Cold War paranoia? The answer reveals a paradox at the heart of nuclear strategy that shaped our world more than most realize. By the mid-1950s, a decisive shift in military thinking had begun to take shape. While scientists like Weisskopf quietly sabotaged the project from within, Pentagon strategists conducted their cold assessment of Sundial's strategic value. Their conclusion was surprising. A weapon with a 10 billion ton yield that could destroy the world offered almost no tactical advantage, like possessing a chess piece that could only end the game in stalemate. Declassified documents reveal the fundamental problem military planners identified, Sundial's strategic inflexibility. In an age where nuclear strategy evolved beyond simple retaliation, the Pentagon favored weapons offering graduated response options. A single device capable of global annihilation represented an all-or-nothing approach that military strategists found impractical for actual conflict scenarios. This rejection stemmed from pragmatic military calculation. A weapon too powerful to use becomes strategically worthless. The military preferred an arsenal of smaller, more numerous nuclear weapons deployable in various scenarios without triggering civilization's end. One Pentagon assessment from the period stated, a weapon that offers only mutual destruction proves tactically inflexible and strategically limited in all scenarios short of absolute global conflict. This insight drove the project's abandonment and shaped nuclear doctrine for decades. The shift away from doomsday weapons coincided with the emergence of flexible response doctrine, providing military leaders with a spectrum of options beyond surrender or apocalypse. Smaller tactical nuclear weapons, conventional forces, and limited strikes became part of a nuanced strategy that Sundial couldn't accommodate. What emerged was a strategic approach that, paradoxically, made nuclear war more conceivable by making weapons seem more usable. Instead of a single world-ending device, the superpowers built thousands of nuclear weapons with varying yields, deployed across submarines, bunkers, and missile silos. Military planners viewed this as more reasonable precisely because it allowed proportional responses to threats. The irony persists. Though Sundial never progressed beyond theoretical designs, humanity effectively built a doomsday machine anyway, distributed across thousands of individual weapons rather than concentrated in one device. Environmental consequences proved equal
equally decisive in Sundial's rejection. Scientists had begun to grasp what would later be formalized as nuclear winter theory. The massive toxic fallout from a Sundial detonation would create death clouds circling the globe, making the weapon essentially a form of global suicide. Military strategists recognized that while conventional nuclear war might leave some territories habitable, Sundial guaranteed catastrophic global temperature drops, widespread contamination, and worldwide crop failures, a game with no winners. The concept of a backyard bomb raised serious practical concerns too. The enormous 2,000-ton stationary device presented logistical challenges military planners found insurmountable. Ultimately, the military's rejection of Project Sundial reveals an important truth. Even during the most paranoid heights of the Cold War, practical constraints and strategic calculations imposed limits on destructive technology. The abandonment wasn't driven primarily by moral considerations, though scientists certainly raised them, but by the cold recognition that such a weapon failed to serve any rational military objective. As we conclude our exploration of Project Sundial, we're left with a sobering reality. Though this particular doomsday weapon never materialized, the nuclear shadow still looms large over humanity. Today, approximately 12,000 nuclear weapons remain scattered worldwide, enough destructive capability to end civilization. Standing beneath the shadow of these nuclear giants, Sundial's abandonment marks a pivotal moment where technology confronts moral boundaries. This lesson resonates powerfully today as we face new frontiers in AI, autonomous weapons, and biotechnology. Sundial teaches us that even our most brilliant scientific achievements must be guided by ethical foresight, a responsibility that shapes not just our present, but humanity's future.